This program is brought to you by Emory University. The uh, first Emory University STEM Research and Career Symposium. And since this is the first time, we're making it up as we go along. So we hope it works for you. Uh, it's wonderful to see as many uh, people from as far away as California, Puerto Rico, uh, Virgin Islands, and of course all over the Southeast. And that's exactly what we hoped for. And, and your participation is extremely valuable. And I hope that you get something out of it too. We want you to see Emory, of course, but we don't want this to be a sales job. We want you to learn a little bit about what you can expect if you choose this as a career going forward. Ask any questions you have of the faculty and the assistant representatives that you'll encounter. Uh, they're wearing red tag names. So uh, use this as an opportunity to gather information and to make contacts and to begin uh, expanding your network that ultimately will be of significant value to you no matter what you do going forward. So I don't want to take too much time here because George is on a, a tight schedule this morning, but uh, our speaker this morning to open the session is Dr. George Jones. Uh, he's a professor uh, of the Department of Biology and I think now retired. Uh, George uh, has a storied career in biosciences. He uh, got his bachelor's degree from Harvard uh, and then did uh, PhD work at the University of California with one of the uh, uh, icons, I think you'd have to say, of biochemistry, Clinton Ballou. Uh, he then went on uh, to the NIH for a couple of years, Geneva for a couple of years, and then in, in 1971, joined the zoology department at the University of Michigan. And in Michigan, he worked up through the ranks, uh, wore several hats, including uh, chair of a division, uh, a dean, associate dean of the graduate school, a Rackham Graduate School. And in 1989, uh, uh, George was lured to Emory. That was. Uh, the, actually at the birth of the Graduate Division of Biological and Biomedical Sciences. So this reorganization cast PhD training in an interdisciplinary and more importantly interdepartmental uh, status, which means that, and, and it's been a, a resounding success in terms of building interactions between faculty and programs and departments who otherwise wouldn't have interacted if it wasn't for the commonality of the students who were holding together the collaborations and our interactions. So uh, George was instrumental in supporting and nurturing that in the early years as uh, Dean of the Graduate School here at Emory. He also served as acting uh, Dean of the college for a year and is now, uh, or had retired with a Goodrich C. White professorship in biology at Emory University. George's research all during that period, even with these impressive administrative duties, has been very vital. He uh, works on the antibiotic resistance uh, in, uh, or antibiotic synthesis in Streptomyces, and more recently in how that's coupled to RNA metabolism in that organisms. So I think at this point, I will just invite George to come up and make his remarks. There'll be time for... There'll be time for questions after his talk. Well, thank you for that introduction, Keith, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. We're glad to have you all here. As Keith said, it's, it's, we're de all, delighted that all of you have come, many from, from so far away. And we do hope that you will enjoy your stay here, that you'll learn everything that there is to learn, at least in the amount of time you have available about Emory, about the graduate division, and about what it is like to, to have a career in the biomedical sciences. So let me, as you can see, the title of my talk today is going to be Doing Science. And it seems to me that, it seemed to me when I thought about what I would say to you after Keith asked me to make some remarks this morning, that that would be an appropriate title, because that's what I think of myself as having done for the last 45 years or so. 
As you can see, and as Keith in indicated, I am a professor of biology emeritus. I retired officially in September of 2012, but I am unofficially not retired, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that in just a few minutes. So let me move on and tell you a little bit about what I am going to be saying this morning. Who I am and how I got here, 45 years of doing science, four things that you all need to know about being successful sciences, which will be accompanied by a little demonstration. And finally, there will be plenty of time at the end of my remarks for questions and answers. And with regard to that issue of plenty of time, of course, the question that I'm sure that's, all, that's in all of your minds right now is, are you going to have to listen to me drone on for 45 minutes? And the answer to that question is no. I, as far as public speaking is concerned, I tend to con continue to be governed by the words of a former dean of the Yale University Law School who said a number of years ago that just as in contemporary America, it is impossible to be too rich or too thin, no speech by a dean can be too short. <laughs> I'm not a dean anymore, but I still continue those to be words to live by. So you're not going to have to listen to me, at least you're not going to have to listen to me lecture or preach to you for 45 minutes. So let's begin with who I am and how I got here. Does anybody know who that is? <laughs> not related to me. <laughs> Nobody knows? No, that's, but, but that, would, that would have been an excellent guess, Keith, but no, that's not George Jones but same general category. That's Merle Haggard. Anybody ever heard of Merle Haggard? <laughs> yeah. If you've heard of Merle Haggard, can you still hear me if I'm not in front of the mic? Yeah. yeah. If you haven't heard, if you've heard of Merle Haggard, you know that one of his favorite, uh, famous songs is, I'm proud to be an OB from Muskogee. <laughs> now, if you know anything about that song, you may have thought that Muskogee was some sort of fictional place like Oz or Never Never Land or Los Angeles. <laughs> but it's not. Muskogee is a real place. It's a little town in northeastern Oklahoma, and it's where I grew up. I'm an Ogie from Muskogee. <laughs> and one of the things that was important about my upbringing was the value of education. From the time that I, as far back as I can remember, my parents, my community, my teachers all instilled in me the value of education and motivated me to learn as much as I could learn and to go as far as I could go with that knowledge. One of the things I like to tell my students is that I never had a conversation with my parents about whether I would go to college. It was always assumed that I would. It was always where, never where. And that was all related to the issue of education as a way to not only improve myself, but to also raise the boat for those around me. And I think, I, I can't but imagine that all of you also appreciate the value of education. And so one of the things that I hope you'll take away from my remarks this morning is that you too need to go as far as you can go. You need to reach as high as you can because there isn't much that you can't, won't be able to do if you have that attitude. So I'm proud to be an Okie from Muskogee. How did I get to be an Okie from Muskogee? <laughs> well, as I said, education was always an important factor. And so when it came time to choose a college, my feeling was that I should try for the best I could. And as far as I was aware at that time, the best university that I knew of in the United States was Harvard. I had no way of knowing whether or not I was qualified to get into Harvard and whether or not I could be successful when I got there. But again, the values that I learned in my little town said to me, you're not going to get in if you don't apply. So I applied. I went through the process. I was interviewed. And lo and behold, I got in. And four years later, I graduated with a degree in biochemical sciences. Went on from there, as Dr. Wilkinson said, to get a PhD in biochemistry at the University of California at Berkeley. And again, won't begin with all of the additional details, but it was always a question of going as far as I could. And that's, that's still the case today. 
and you, you'll see I hope some evidence that it doesn't matter. So that's pretty much how I got to be an Okie from Muskogee. There wasn't a lot for me to do there as much as I loved and still love that little town, but I, and I needed to get out if I was going to go further. So, what have I been doing with my life for much of the last 45 years? So, I've been involved in a number of different kinds of research areas. During my very first postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health, I worked with a guy named Herbert Weisbach. And he basically put me on a research project that was going to essentially influence the, my research interests for the rest of my career. So my research deals with a group of bacteria called Streptomyces. Anybody ever heard of Streptomyces? Why is Streptomyces important? Who can tell me what these are? These are all antibiotics. How many of you have ever had to take an antibiotic for any sort of infection? Probably just about everybody. Back in my youth, when I was your age, I thought that antibiotics were made by little gnomes in the laboratory sewer stitching carbon molecules together. But I learned as a result of my experience as a postdoctoral fellow that nearly all of the antibiotics that are used in clinical and veterinary medicine worldwide are synthesized as natural products by members of the genus Streptomyces. All these antibiotics, plus many, many more, are synthesized as natural products by Streptomyces. Nearly 75% of all of the antibiotics used in clinical and veterinary medicine are produced by this bacterial genus. And about 10 years ago, some guys did some mathematical modeling to try to predict how many antibiotics, how many different antibiotics, this group of organisms, Streptomyces, as a whole, were capable of synthesizing. The number they came up with was 100,000. That these bacteria have the capability of synthesizing 100,000 different antibiotics. How many of them do you think we've already found? Take a guess. How many? Thousand. Close. Look, a few more. <laughs> 3,000. We've, we've been able to identify 3,000 different Streptomyces antibiotics. So if these guys are right, we've got 97,000 additional antibiotics that Streptomyces are capable of making that we haven't found yet. And given the problems with infectious diseases generally, the problem of antibiotic <coughs> resistance, which I'm sure you all know something about, Antibiotic therapies are going to continue to be important for the foreseeable future. And that makes this group of organisms, I think, that much more important because of their ability to produce <coughs> antibiotics. So this is one of the organisms that I work with. It's called Streptomyces silicone. And he said there's a laser on here somewhere. There it is. These are solid cultures, cultures on otter, a Streptomyces silicone at various times after inoculation of the otter plates. And I show them to you because of the fact that this particular organism, Streptomyces silicone, makes four different antibiotics, two of which are pigmented, two of which are colored. So you can see those two here. One of them is red. It appears first when you start growing the antibiotic. The other one is blue, very dark blue. And while these antibiotics don't, these particular antibiotics don't have clinical significance, they, the organism has been extremely important as a model helping us to understand how and why these organisms make the antibiotics they do. As I said, the organism makes four. Two of them are pigmented. The other two are colorless. They're being made in this, under these conditions, but you just can't see them because they don't have any color. The other organism, or one of the other organisms that I work with, is an organism called Streptomyces antibioticus. And these are liquid cultures of Streptomyces antibioticus. Very early, after 24 hours of growth and after 48 hours of growth. And this yellow-orange color that you see there is another antibiotic, one that you probably <coughs> heard about, actinomycin D. Actinomycin D has been very valuable as a biochemical tool, but it's also used even today in the treatment of certain kinds of tumors that tend to be refractory to other kinds of medical, or chemical, and antibiotic treatments. 
So these two organisms, Streptomyces celicolor and Streptomyces antibioticus, are the ones that tend to occupy most of my time. Now, the other reason, in addition to, at least from my personal standpoint, in addition to the antibiotics they produce that I work with, with Streptomyces have to do with what I consider to be an important comparison between these organisms and others like E. coli. This is a, an agar plate of E. coli. How many of you have worked on E. coli? Well, he, we use E. coli in my lab all the time. It's an important organism. It was obviously essential in, in refining, developing and refining the techniques of genetic engineering. A lot of important biology has been done, continues to be done on, on, on E. coli, but at least in terms of the way they look, E. coli is boring. <laughs> so one of the reasons that I work as much as I can with Streptomyces, because Streptomyces are pretty. <laughs> this is Streptomyces silicolor on the left, again an agar colony, and it's, you can see that it's already starting to turn a little blue, that's the blue antibioticus that it makes. Streptomyces lividans, a related organism, that's the, the red antibiotic that you can see there. So Streptomyces are exciting, <laughs> and they're beautiful, <laughs> and they're interesting. And that's one of the reasons that I work with these organisms, because they are so <coughs> interesting to work with. Still use E. coli, but really like the streptomycins. OK. I don't know whether you noticed this when I showed this slide before, but I had highlighted the word deals when I talked about my research. Why is deals highlighted? The answer is that even though I'm retired, I'm still doing research. My lab is still going. I still have some resources that I haven't used up yet that will support the experiments and the people working in my laboratory. Even though I've been retired now for about eight months, I'm in the lab every day. Why is that? There are two important reasons that I want you to know about. The first is that I have some projects that I want to finish that I'd like to bring to a publishable conclusion before I write off into the sunset. <laughs> the second is that I love doing science. I've always loved it. I've never wanted to be anything else. Never wanted to be a physician. Never wanted to be a lawyer. There was a time when I wanted to race motorcycles, but that was another life. I've always wanted to do science. And I honestly can say that I'm not sure how I'm going to feel when I lock the door of my lab for the last time. There are other things I want to do with the rest of my life. So I'm not, and from that standpoint, I'm not, I, I know I won't be completely sad. But it will be the end of a chapter of my life that has not only been important in terms of getting me from there to here, it's also been important because of the fact that I love it so much. And I hope that if anything, if you take anything away from my remarks this morning, it will be that enthusiasm for science, which I hope all of you will develop if you haven't developed it already, because doing science is really fun. Getting Mother Nature to, to unravel, un, to reveal her secrets, for me, is just a blast. And I have enjoyed almost every minute of the time that I have spent doing science. No, I haven't enjoyed every minute, but I've enjoyed a lot of it. OK. Who am I and how I got here 40 years of doing science? Four things you all need to know, and this is where the demonstration comes in. So if you'll just give me a sec. Now, I was told when you do these kinds of things, you shouldn't apologize first, because that just sets people up for disappointment. But I'm going to apologize, because I'm not nearly as good at this as I used to be. But I'm going to give it a shot anyhow. I wasn't born knowing even how to do what I'm able to do now. 
But a number of years ago, I decided I wanted to learn how to juggle, so I took a class. And there was a time when I was better than I am now. So don't be afraid to try new things. You will have opportunities both professionally and personally to expand your horizons. When those opportunities arise, you should take advantage of them. That's point number one. Point number two, let's see if I can get any better at this. The answer is no. <laughs> Point number two is that there will be times in your lives when you've got to keep several balls in the air at once. Don't be afraid to engage in those situations. There'll be times when you're going to need to be doing research, when you'll be teaching, when you'll be advising students, when you'll be dealing with issues in your personal life. You can learn to do those things successfully and simultaneously to the extent that you have to do so. Don't be concerned about the need to keep more than one ball in the air at once. Point number three is one which I think my skills will be very appropriate for. There will be times when you'll drop a ball, maybe more than one. Don't be discouraged when that happens. It happens to all of us. It happens to Nobel Prize winners. It happens to professional athletes. It happens to the President of the United States. There will be times when you drop a ball. When that happens, don't worry about it. What you should do is, point number four, what? Pick it up and try again. I'm going to stop. <laughs> Quick while you're ahead. Okay. So those are my formal remark, remarks. And what I would like to do for the remainder of my time is to answer any questions as best I can that you may have. Yes. When you, when you first set out from the, the beginning of your research, did you have an end point in mind? Or, or when, you, when you met a fork in the road, did you kind of just weigh your options in the moment and make decisions rather than following a, a straight path? Along? That's an excellent question. The answer is that when I started, I thought I had an end point in mind. <laughs> but in fact, as the research progresses, as I'm sure you're all aware, you come to forks, you come to questions that in some cases turn out to be more interesting than the one you, that's, that's got you started in the first place. So I was initially interested in, in just how these organisms make antibiotics. I got interested in other aspects of their biochemistry as time went on and moved on in directions that were very different from what I thought might be the, my ultimate direction when I got started. So the sort of, sort of, what are two syllable answer to your question is, is the, the Yogi, Yogi Berra quotation. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> yes? What's been the most um, challenging for you about doing science? Most challenging. Certainly one of the most challenging aspects of science for me has been keeping good, good people in my lab. Not so much attracting good people, but you attract good people and they, and because they're good, they have other opportunities. I mean, I've lost a couple of, of, of research associates in the last decade or so who were just outstanding, but they had other places to go. They had other things to do. And if I had kept them, I think the lab would have been a lot more productive than it ultimately has been. And I suspect all of the, the practicing scientists in the, in the audience would agree with that to a certain extent. Attracting good people and keeping good people is always a real challenge, but it's essential if the people are going to run a productive research activity. Yes? I don't know if I didn't hear you clearly or uh, with something. Um, why did you say it's drug use so many different antibodies? Well, for, for one thing, the Streptomyces genome is bigger than most bacteria. E. coli is about four megabases. Streptomyces is about nine megabases. 
so at least twice the size of the E. coli genome. And it's clear from the number of streptomyces genomes that have been sequenced that a large fraction of the genome is devoted to making antibiotics and other similar types of metabolites. So the organisms clearly then just have the capacity because they've evolved to do so, to make many, many, many of these antibiotics. As I said, 100,000 is the estimate that these guys who did the mathemat mathematical modeling made 100 a few years ago. Yes? So the question, if all of you didn't hear it, is how I chose biochemistry. So I went to Harvard as a chemistry major. And my junior year, I took a biochemistry course from, that was taught by a guy named James, I'm sorry, John T. S. I don't know if that's the name that you've heard, but Essel was one of the, the, grand, the godfathers of biochemistry. And I was hooked. He was an excellent teacher. It was a really fascinating course. And so the second semester of my junior year, I switched my major to biochemistry because I, was, I, I found the subject just fascinating. And then graduated with a degree in, in biochemistry and went on to graduate work. Yes? Good morning, everyone. My name is Lakeisha Williams, and I'm a junior at Howard University. And my question is, uh, you said that uh, in your hometown, education was a very important aspect of life. So what is your advice to someone who is discouraged about getting a PhD after that? Well, I guess <laughs> my first question would be, why are you discouraged? Um, so what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess my 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 faculty answer is that that's not a good reason. <laughs> my per more personal answer would be that, again, it's sort of related to my demonstration. There were times when I was discouraged. <coughs> my first year in graduate school at, at UC Berkeley, I said I never wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or any of those kinds of things. But this was the 60s, long before any of you guys were born. And we were all supposed to be relevant back in the day. And so I didn't think about both law school and medical school because while I had always known I wanted to be a scientist, I didn't know that I wanted necessarily want to get a PhD. But after, again, I got into the coursework, and, I, and particularly after I started working in the lab and realized how much I enjoyed it, that, that basically closed the door on everything else. So if you, anything that you want to do that is going to have a significant impact on your life, on the life of those around you. It's going to be hard. And you just got to suck it up and do what's hard. And get to it. You got this far. Where are you from? Are you from, are you from DC? No, I'm from New York. From New York. OK, well, you got this far. Why would you think you could go the next step? <laughs> Got an MBA. 
And she's now working in the School of Public Health here at Emory, and she's hoping to go on and get a PhD in public health. So I think that, that, that the sort of idea that you have suggested is exactly the way that you all should be thinking. You may want to become a Wilkinson or Jones clone and go on to a faculty position at a research university, have your own lab, get grants, hopefully, <laughs> and you know, publish papers. But not every that's not for everybody. So the other options are, I think, are exactly the kinds of things that you could you should consider. Law and science, business and science, religion and science. I think those are all reasonable options and appropriate to consider as you think about your future. Yes? So where did you do your postdoc and what made you go there? So I did my first postdoc, with, as I said, with a guy named Herb Weisbach at the, at the National Institutes of Health. And he was a close friend of my PhD advisor. And it was clear from my graduate work that I had interest in enzymology and my, my PhD advisor thought that his would be a good lab for me to go to to learn some additional enzymology, and, and he was right. Now, after I had, I had a three-year fellowship at the time. After my first year, Herb Weisbach decided to move to a private research institute in New Jersey, and I decided I didn't want to leave D.C. at that time. So I then moved to another laboratory there at the NIH where I worked for another year. And up to that time, I had never been out of the United States, well, and not entirely, but I had never been to, to Europe. I had been Canada and places like that, but I've never been to Europe. And so I had another year left on my postdoctoral fellowship, and I said, well, maybe this is an opportunity for me to do some study abroad. So I then did a third postdoc at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And that, again, provides me with an opportunity to spend some time in Europe, get, be exposed to a different culture, and also to do some research in, in, a, in a, a stimulating and highly productive environment. So it was, at, it was after that third postdoc that I then went back to the faculty position at the University of Michigan. Not back, went to the faculty position at the University of Michigan. Why do you mean to go there? Well, I've never been there before. <laughs> and, and it seemed to me that, that having the opportunity not just to go there and visit for a couple of weeks, but to go there and live for, as it turned out, about 15 months was just something that I couldn't pass up. So I got in touch with this guy who was working in an area that was similar to what I had been doing and asked him if he would be willing to have me come and work in his lab for a year. He said yes. It was a good experience. Geneva was a very expensive city to live in. <laughs> so I didn't live very well. But I had a good time. Yes? How did you manage those like balance in the past 45 years? Say again, how did I manage? Work-life balance. Well, again, it's, it's related to the, the to my four points. You just you, you do what you have to do. For a significant part of my career at Michigan, I was a single parent. There were times when I had to take my daughter to the lab with me. There were times when I had to take my daughter to class with me. But I felt that was it was more important for me to do that than it was to it was. It, it was not only important in terms of my accomplishing my goals, it was important in terms of her being able to see what I did for a living and to see that it was important. And in the end, all those kinds of opportunities, I think, worked out very well for both of us. One of the advantages of faculty, being a faculty member, at least at an institution like Emory, is that one of the perks is sabbaticals. So I've been, been fortunate to have four sabbaticals in my time as a faculty member. The first of those I took at, in, in, at a research institute in England, and I took my daughter with me. And she had a terrific time, and I had a terrific time, and again, there were times when I had to take her to the lab. There were times when, you know, when I couldn't do certain things because of the fact that, that, I, that, I, that she was my responsibility and my first responsibility. But you, but you do what you have to do. And if, you're, if you don't if, look at it, as I never did, as a as a verb, she was never a verb to me. Then it was able, I was, it was possible for me not only to do these things successfully, but frequently to make them fun. Yes? One of the things you said was when you drop a ball, pick it back up. What is your approach to that? It seems like you would probably be pretty honest to say, I dropped it and move on. But how would you recommend approaching getting back on? 
first question is that you need to ask yourself is why you dropped. What happened that caused you to drop that role? If you, once you've answered that question, you then you need to ask yourself the question, can I do this again in a way that will keep me from making that same mistake? Or do I have to move on to something completely different? Sometimes it is the second of those two that's the answer. That you don't want to just pick that ball up and start juggling it again. Maybe you need a new set of, of, of juggling tools. Maybe you need to think about a, a different approach than juggling all together. So the first question is, why did you drop the ball? The second question is, what can you do in order to keep from having that happen again? And sort of related to that, does it require simply doing what you're doing differently, or does it require doing something entirely different? Yes? Hi, my name is Mary Houston from Vanderbilt State University. I'm a senior there. My question is, you mentioned that there will be times when you have to keep seven balls in the air at one time. Well, three. <laughs>
there are what are called polyketide antibiotics, a couple of the organisms that you know, the streptomyces that I talk about make polyketides. So there are families of these 3,000. I can't tell you how many they are, but there are families of these, these 3,000 antibiotics that various individual antibiotics fall into. Now, with regard to how many new families there might be, that's anybody's guess. Certainly, if there really are 90, 97,000 others out there, then some of those will fall into the same families that we already know exist. But it is likely that there's some new families out there as well that we haven't identified. And the next question is that currently there's very many people who are working in the Say that again. So the comment was that motivating young people to go into research was very challenging. How would you do that? Well, you guys tell me how would you how, how would you how would you encourage one of your friends to, to do research? What?
what the potentials are in, in those areas of research and the kinds of things that they are doing that you might be interested in. And one thing that I want you to keep in mind is that you make a commitment to graduate school, and ideally you follow that commitment through to the end. But if after a year or six months or whatever, you find that it's not the, the path for you, that's not the end of the world. Again, you pick the ball up and you go do something different. So let me apologize. I'm going to have to leave now because I've got a doctor's appointment. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for listening to me for the last 45 minutes. And good luck. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.